Greetings, and this time on LGR, we're looking at a quirky little system from one of my favorite time periods and form factors, mid-90s sub-notebooks. Specifically one from the early Pentium era in portables, where you had to shell out serious cash for a laptop with a fancy Pentium processor. And the more miniaturized the machine, the higher the cost, as exemplified by the HP Omnibook 800CT initially launching in the autumn of 1996. The 800 was the final sub-notebook in the Omnibook line that began in 1993 and the highest spec one as a result, originally offered with a 133 MHz Pentium CPU. And by early 97, the newly introduced Pentium MMX was an option, as seen on my particular 800 CT here, the F1360A model which packs a beefy 166 MHz Pentium MMX inside. And for the pleasure, you'd be coughing up $4,750 upon its launch in the summer of 1997, a cool nine grand adjusted for inflation today. Actually kind of average for a Pentium laptop of a similar spec back then. If you wanted the cutting edge stuff, then prepare your wallet for pain. Also consider that Hewlett Packard's 5700 CTX cost a whopping $5,800 in 1997, packing the same CPU as the 800 CT, just with a larger screen and form factor, putting it in the full-sized category. Whether large or small though, these Omnibooks were all targeted at business users, not the average home user. And that's clear the more you dive in. Like, check this out on here, this little window with a pull-out sheet. I was stumped as to what it was supposed to be, but yeah, turns out it's a dedicated holder for a corporate ID card. According to the manual, at least. <laughs> yeah, I've seen this type of thing on business computer laptop bags, but directly on a laptop? I love it. The fact that they built a special little sleeve for your special little ID and this catering to the business crowd made sense. According to one data quest study, an estimated 14.5 million people would buy business laptops in 1997 alone, so companies like Hewlett Packard were happy to oblige. Although this clientele often sought out desktop replacement solutions, and that typically meant something with tons of I.O., a huge screen and weighing like 10 pounds. So if you wanted a laptop that comfortably sat on a lap, then the mid-90s had you covered with ultra-portables or sub-notebook computers. Systems like the Compact Contura Aero, the Gateway Handbook, and Toshiba Libretto being notable examples, and of course, the HP Omnibook range for a few years. And while I enjoy each in their own way, it's the Omnibook that's grabbed my attention for how it melded together the most useful PC components with the smallest footprint and lightest weight they could manage without too much compromise. The 800 CT here weighs just 3.9 pounds, roughly half that of their full-sized Omnibooks. And folded up, it measures 11 by 7 by 1.5 inches, a bit larger than the average hardcover novel. There are some of the usual compromises as expected, like relying on external floppy and optical drives and needing a docking station for things like PS2 ports, expansion slots, and all that. But it's refreshingly generous with everything else considering the small form factor. For example, the screen is excellent for the time, being a 10.4 inch TFT LCD supporting up to 800 by 600 resolution. And I like how it goes all the way to the bottom of the lid, like they really crammed as large a panel in there as possible. Then next to the infrared transceiver, you get full-size parallel serial and VGA ports. No need for any dongles or port replicators, like with many competitors. And the keyboard uses all available real estate too, going straight up to the edges on the left, right, and bottom, allowing for something sub-notebooks often didn't have, full-sized alphanumeric keys. Now, the modifier and cursor keys are all shrunken down a bit, making things cramped in the corners, but it's nothing I couldn't get used to, especially since the keys have some satisfyingly decent travel to them. That on-off key is a bit strange. It uses this for toggling power in lieu of a traditional switch, but at least it's not in a place that's too easily hit by accident. Finally, there's the space-saving mouse that remains hidden away until you press the mouse eject button, which just shonks the thing right out the side. 
This is HP's unique pop-out mouse, something they used on a number of portables through the 90s, like the HP Internet Advisor covered on LGR some years back. It originated in the first Omnibook, though, the 300 model from 1993, and remained an HP staple up until the 800 CT here. The best part about this is it doesn't have any kind of sensor on the bottom, so you can use it in mid-air just as easily as anywhere else. It simply hangs off the edge of this plastic strip, which connects to a handful of internal sensors that detect movement and mouse clicks. But this strength is also a downside, since accuracy and smoothness are clearly affected, and it feels flimsy as a result, not at all confidence-inducing. Always a sticking point with reviewers who described the pop-out mouse as a love-it-or-hate-it thing, and one review I read even called it a fatal flaw. Personally, I quite like it. I think it's a clever solution, and for the majority of tasks, it works well enough. Though I certainly keep a serial mouse plugged in when I can. On the topic of peripherals, get a load of all the stuff that came with this one. I was lucky to find this example of an 800 CT that still had basically everything that came in the box from the factory, and then some. All the paperwork, most of the discs, cables, and accessories, the external 3.5-inch floppy drive, a 32-megabyte system RAM expansion board, a 20-megabyte flash storage drive, PCM-CIA communication cards, two spare lithium-ion batteries, booklets, advertising extras from HP and authorized third parties, and even this fascinating backup solution, the Datasonics Pereos which makes use of the world's smallest cassette tape for storing data. I've covered this bit of oddware in its own dedicated episode if you're curious, but yeah, this 800CT bundle is where I acquired it in the first place. About the only thing this didn't come with is the docking station, though it did come with the power supply for it, so I assume it used to be here too. Adding it all up, they spared no expense. This bundle easily could have cost the original owner nearly $6,000 back in the day. But yeah, enough with the side stuff, let's see what it's actually like to use. Yeah, that poor speaker. I believe it is actually just one little mono speaker over there and it has deteriorated to sounding terrible. And speaking of terrible, <laughs> uh, this little mouse really isn't terrible. I really don't mind using it in a pinch for just basic tasks, but not for a demonstrating a video, so I have it disabled so that we can use an external one here. And, uh, uh, well, yeah, let's just, I don't know, explore this Windows 95 environment, which is what this one happens to come with. Yeah, with the 800CT, there were actually two operating system choices from the factory, with this one obviously going with Windows 95, but you also had Windows for Workgroups 3.11 as an option if you really wanted it, and that certainly would have been a choice in 1997. But yeah, 95 runs wonderfully on here, as you'd hope for a Pentium MMX, and it's helped by the fact that this one actually does have that RAM expansion installed, so the total is 48 megs, and you could take it up to 80 if you were rich enough for a 64 megabyte option. Truly do not know how much that would have cost, I haven't found a price list, but no doubt it would have been a whole lot. Uh, yeah, we have a, a tidy little 2.5 inch hard disk in here, a 2 gigabyte version by Toshiba, and uh, it's still working great uh, all these years later, I'm happy to say. As for what's on here, well, business. <laughs> business, business, business. In fact, I think this actually did belong to HP at some point, according to some of the files on here, which I will not be showing, the previous owner and stuff like that, but yeah, it, there's just a bunch of things on here, and most of it is Pretty boring, but you know, you have some cool things in here that were, uh, where's the thing? Is it this one? Yeah. Kind of a selling point thing that they were quite proud of back in the day. HP was always like, oh, check out our HP DMI. How cool is this? HP user tools. Uh, yeah, you got more stuff here. All kinds of things that you can mess with. Oh, yeah. We do have this little status panel, which shows different things that are going on, like hard disk activity, the battery, the power, keyboard, and stuff like that. Instead of having a little LCD like you see on a lot of larger laptops back then. And yeah, the rest of this is uh, pretty standard messing around with your computer type of stuff. That's just the Windows control panel. Uh, you do have an OK. <laughs> Got a crash is what we have. Uh, a user's guide that you can go through right on here instead of the 
physical one, I don't know, is just a more interactive version of the exact physical manual that I have. I don't think anything in here is any different, but it's searchable. It's got little sound effects. How cool. Anyway, as I said, the rest of this is so very business oriented. I don't know if it actually came with all this or if uh, a lot of this was probably installed by the previous owner, but yeah, Amy Pro and Lotus stuff, Microsoft uh, Office and, and tons of things. Screw that. Let's, uh, let's play some games and uh, talk about crap that you can do. So as for this LCD panel <laughs> and that PC speaker, I don't know if that's coming out of the same broken speaker or not. Yeah, you can at least kind of hear it. It's very quiet. I think you can adjust the volume. Yeah, you, you can adjust the volume of the PC speaker and the like Windows volume or system volume separately. But yeah, I was gonna say the, the panel itself, it's a tad ghosty during fast movement, but for its time, I think it is darned respectable. And uh, you do have different scaling options. There it is, just native, um, pixel perfect or whatever. But uh, you could put it up in the corner. I think for, I was reading the manual, this is something to do with using it in a projector or overhead, I don't know, business presentation stuff. And there it is, just scaled, but it's not, oh, it's so, it's really bad. <laughs> Especially on lower resolutions and text and things. Um, but again, the, uh, I was gonna say about the motion, uh, it's, it's fine. Honestly, yeah, for 96, 97, it's darned respectable. It's, it's a business computer. And for that, I mean, that's really impressive, obviously. You don't even need any kind of really fast motion or movement or anything like that. Uh, any given corpo would have been perfectly impressed by this. It's still a vibrant active matrix and you could do a whole heck of a lot worse. In fact, this was actually offered with a, a DSTN as well, I think, which, ooh, you know, thank goodness it doesn't have that. Yeah, the display is tied to this NeoMagic Magigraph 128ZV. That's the NM2093 chipset with a little over one megabyte of memory, if I recall. I don't actually think it's gonna say in here anywhere. I think it's like 1.1 or something megs. Uh, but yeah, it's a pretty standard chipset, especially in these business computers. In fact, I think it's the same one or very similar in um, my uh, IBM ThinkPad 380XD. Uh, again, really not bad at all. Certainly enough for 16-bit color, SVGA and all that. And of course, business, 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 you can get 16-bit color presentations, ooh. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but it does have two PCM CIA slots or PC card slots supporting two type two or uh, one type three PCM CIA card. Right now I just have a compact flash adapter in there, which it's great for that. Another thing that's kind of awesome is the sound chip that's in here, the ESS 1887 plug and play audio drive, which actually is a pretty good sound chip for what it is. I mean, all the legacy support that you want uh, in terms of DOS. Let's just get Tyrion and 2000 going here. You can hear uh, those crappy speakers doing their thing. Uh, it's just so bad through this poor broken little speaker. <laughs> Let me plug in these uh, Roland's over here. Oh yeah. It, it just, it sounds good. <laughs> Yeah, dude. No complaints. In fact, I, th I, I seem to remember the game running pretty well too. I mean, it should. It's a Pentium 166. Yeah, again, a bit of a smeary display and not the best viewing angles, but truly there are so many. I believe this is pretty much top of the line for, for when it came out. Uh, especially for the size, like it's just a good size. Uh, 10.4 inches or whatever. I, I do wish that it was just straight up 640 by 480 so we didn't have this. I mean, the scaling actually looks pretty good here, but yeah, there's the native again. It really just depends on what you're running, you know, in terms of whether or not you notice this awful scaling. Yeah, I don't know. I could complain, but I won't. It's, it's actually really good for what it is. Oh yeah, another thing I meant to mention, I guess we'll go ahead and do it here. So you have this, this function strip uh, with all of the different you know, function keys represented by a little 
a little window there and some pre-printed graphics. And actually, if um, you, you press some of those, like that'll bring up the, that, this'll bring up Explorer. Uh, that'll bring up uh, user tools and so on and whatnot. You can actually program those, a pretty handy little thing that you often saw back in the day. And uh, yeah, each company did it differently. This is how HP does it. And you can you know, change things, but also, just like the ID card, you've got this little pull-out strip here that you can, uh, yeah, swap it out with different programs that might have come with their own strip or just draw or print on here, whatever you want. Anyway, let's go to something we've always got to do in here because, of course, a little bit of Duke Nukem 3D. And yeah, the uh, that sound is wonderful. I, I'm just so happy when I find a computer of this era uh, well, portable laptop, you know, with a good sound chip in it, because you're just stuck with it otherwise, unless you want to replace it with some PCM CIA thing. Let's rock. This is at 320 by 240, I believe, or 320 by 200. Let's put it up to 640 by 480. See how it works with Visa compatibility. Or just 800 by 600, I mean, you, you could try. It's going to be bad. Uh, with a Pentium 166, but uh, this should be decent. Yeah, definitely not the full like 60 FPS all the time or anything, but um, yeah, certainly capable of uh, getting some decent performance here at 640 by 480. It's the power of the Pentium, baby. And of course, MMX is not, <laughs> I don't think it, not that I'm aware uh, any of those instructions are gonna do anything for like DOS games, but, oh jeez, get down here so I can kill you already. Yeah, there are definitely some games that'll take advantage of the uh, instruction set and, well, uh, you know. So let's try one of those. So I've got a virtual CD-ROM mounted with good old Demon Tools and uh, Ubisoft's Pod, which, was promoted as an MMX enhanced game. That does not require MMX, but I have installed the uh, retail MMX version here. So let's give that a shot. And this does run at 640 by 480, no matter what, uh, at least with this version and sound or, or graphics chip. Uh, you actually can't change anything there in terms of the uh, graphical settings. So yeah, we're already running into that <laughs> sort of expected just uh, lagginess and oh choppiness in these menus i have always said that you really need a good 233 megahertz preferably pentium 2 or amd k6 or something but it is playable <laughs> i need no pure software rendering here so there's the native non-scaled version but it's such a chunky, weird-looking game anyway that I actually don't mind the scaling uh, being as awful as it is. Okay. It's trying. If this was a computer that a parent brought home from work and you didn't have anything else, yeah, I totally would have played the crap out of this. I mean, you know, it's pod. <laughs> All right, it's just not ideal. Oh, so choppy. Uh, what else is it gonna try on here? Oh yeah, in terms of how far you can kind of push it, well, even games 1997-ish are uh, kind of pushing it, 3D games anyway, uh, like Pod there. But you can go up to 1998 and get some functionality out of things. So we've got FIFA 98 here and we've copyrighted music. Let's turn that down. So uh, yeah, it's just the demo version here, but just to kind of give you an example of the kind of performance you can expect from this really expensive computer for the time. Again, not too awful. I think I would call this playable, honestly. Yeah. For uh, software rendering, Let's see if I can remember any of these controls. That's not it. What are the controls? Oh no, is this set to play with the mouse? It is! Oh! I've done that so many times accidentally with some of these earlier FIFAs. Mouse controlling, if you like move the mouse while you're selecting a controller. See, look at that, why, why is it, 
I want this to, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Ooh. Oh, that was the wrong button. I felt good about that. Oh, don't you do it. Don't you do it. <laughs> anyway, uh, fully playable in my opinion for, uh, for what it is. For almost $5,000, you sure would hope. Yeah! Where's the murder button? I seem to remember it being a nice murder button. There we go. <laughs> Give me that red card. <laughs> That's right. I was just like trying to get out as many players as I can. You just, you just press A and it's just basically a, just destroy the, the uh, person closest to you. Ooh. Let's see if we can get an own goal here. Yeah! So good at this. That's how you play soccer, right? All right, well, anyway. That, that, that's pretty much it for this delightful Omni book, I think. I just felt like talking about it and showing it in a video because I haven't done that, even though I've shown it in bits and pieces here and there, I think, for other various projects. I know I've used this uh, just to capture and run certain things because it has all of the specs and capabilities of not being really too fast or too slow. It's just firmly in late 96, early 97, really, with this MMX. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a delightful machine for what it is. Great for the time screen. Really good sound chip, especially for DOS games. It's delightful and really was the last of its line, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the uh, 800 CT here being the, the final sub notebook, at least as far as I know. There were a number of other Omni books after this, up until like the early 2000s when they stopped using the model name. But as far as I know, those were all closer to full-sized notebooks. And this one with its just quirky little mouse and goofy little ID holder and <laughs> just everything about it. The fact that it actually has so many full-sized ports is just really cool. I like this thing a whole lot. And I hope that you've enjoyed taking a look at it with me. Let me know if you did have one of these or more than likely knew somebody else who did. I, you'd have had to have been pretty well off or had this given to you as like a corporate business machine or something, or I don't know, maybe you ran across one secondhand for a pretty darn good price like I did many years after it was already obsolete. Uh, whatever the case may be, I hope you enjoyed this and thank you as always for watching LGR.